My name's Hazel Barton. I'm chair of the Committee on the Status of Women in Microbiology for the American Society for Microbiology. ASM is very supportive of women in microbiology and issues affecting women in microbiology. And as part of that um, effort to promote women in microbiology, they're recording a number of conversations with prominent female microbiologists who have changed the field of microbiology. And it's my very great pleasure to talk to Dr. Melissa Goldschmidt, who we all affectionately call Mimi. She is an emeritus professor at the, in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in Houston. Um, and Mimi, you got, your, you got your bachelor's degree back in, when was that, 1947. 47. What was it like? Did, was that in bacteriology? I decided in a junior that I had to take micro. I knew when I was 10 years old I was going to be a biologist, but I didn't, and I went, of course, to school, but, but when, I, when, we, when I was a freshman in college and, I, and we had a module on microbiology, I didn't think I ever could spell all those names. So I avoided microbiology until I was a junior when I was forced to take it. And I fell in love with it. What was it that make you, made you fall in love with it? I, I think it was the fact that I really realized how important that microorganisms were, that you can't live with them and you can't live without them. And it was a contest and a test. Mm -hmm. And it was a war and it was, it was a pleasure at the same time. So that you needed it and you, and you couldn't live without them and you and you couldn't live with them, and you had to come to some sort of a compromise, so you, a symbiotic relationship rather than a war, a patho pathogenic relationship is what I was hoping for. Yeah. So you got your PhD in 1953. Yes. Were there a lot of women getting PhDs <laughs> in micro back then? I'll tell you, when I went to graduate school, I met my husband, who was in the same department, I was asked, did you come to get an MRS or a PhD? And, and um, I was told, my husband was told to keep me barefoot and pregnant. And they were upset that I got married in graduate school. And they were really more upset when I had children after I got my degree. You know, we have trained a mother. We shouldn't have women graduate students. They were really upset when I had children. How many, how many women professors were there in the program? There was one woman professor that I did my, my work under. Everyone else in the department was male. There were, there were a couple of women doing master's degrees. They forced women to get a master's degree first, which I, which I did at Purdue. And then uh, they decided whether they would let you go on for a, for a doctorate. Mm -hmm. And there was just one woman professor, and the whole other, there were no women at all. There were other women graduate students, but there were no other women professors in the department. So who, who was your role model that made you think that, you know, I, I as a woman should be able to do this too? I, her name was Dorothy Paulson, and she took me on because I had started to work under Dr. Henry Koffler, and he kept changing the projects that he wanted me to work on. And my husband is steaming right ahead on his doctorate. So I was desperate, and she said she had funds, and so I worked on uh, uh, stash, uh, stash, Staph aureus. It was called Pneumococcus pyogenes variety 207. So it, it was a mi Micrococcus pyogenes, which is the same as staph. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what I worked on for my degree. And what did you do after your degree? After my degree, I followed my husband because he took a postdoc. And I worked uh, at the medical school in a department that was interested in the fact that women were having... Um, not abortions, but miscarriages, and they needed somebody to test their urine for 
for, for the ability for certain microorganisms. So I was doing assays in this laboratory on, on women who were determined to have children and yet had, and they were feeding them different diets like tremendous vitamin diets so that they could conceive. Uh, so I, I worked on that until my husband's almost two years were up and I became pregnant toward the end of that time. And um, I moved with him. We went to the University of Georgia and I, I worked with him in his laboratory. And when we worked at Fort Detrick, I, I was able to get several positions. I taught, would you believe it or not, beginning freshman chemistry. And then I went to work at Fort Detrick for two different groups. One group was very interesting because we were studying the effect of shock waves from explosions on bacteria. Oh, wow. And if you can imagine me present, pregnant with my second child with a hard hat on, behind sandbags, pressing down on a plunger and blowing a pillow <laughs> of bacteria up in the air on a little uh, parachute, and then taking it back to the lab and looking to see what the effect of shock waves were. So that was very interesting. And when that little thing ended, I worked with the Walter Reed Medical Unit on uh, Bacilla anthracis, and I tried to take the spores and get them physiologically the same age so that when they would sporulate, they would all sporulate at the same age so that when they, when they came out of sporulations to become bacterial cells again, they would all be the same physiologic age. So, so was I that... worked on that until, until we moved to Texas. So I want to talk about your, your career in Texas, because most of what I've read in the literature about your, your work was mostly diagnostic, but I want to talk about your most famous um, student. So uh, your most famous student was Neil Armstrong, correct? Oh, when I was, when we moved to, finally moved to Houston, well, I took a two-year postdoc on a Zotobacter up in Austin with Orville Weiss, who was a president of the ASM. And then my husband accepted a job at MD Anderson in the University of Texas. So we moved, yes, we moved and I worked at Baylor. I started part-time again under Robert, Robert Williams, who was another president, came in to be another president of the ASM. They were paying me all of $12,000 a year. Uh, and they said, would you please could you take the job at, and go out to NASA and be the director of the, of the laboratory that plans what uh, they're going to do with the first moon rocks that come back and how to swab the astronauts and what kind of tests to run on the moon samples? So I said, sure, my husband is now tenured and, uh, and I can take the year out of my time to, uh, to do this. So I spent a year and a half, almost two years at NASA, planning uh, with NASA what to do as far as setting up the laboratory and what the test samples and so forth were that we were going to expose to the moon rocks when they brought the moon rocks back. And we had to teach Neil and we had to teach Buzz Aldrin how to aseptically sample the dirt. It wasn't to be where their fingerprints were and their footprints because they off-gassed from their, from their suits, which at that point were very, very ripe because they hadn't taken baths or anything. So they, had, they were really smelly by the time they got back. So we were very careful with them. And uh, I had an enjoyable time doing the labs, it was a little bit frustrating because um, I had to report back to Baylor. And one of the people I reported back to Baylor was a very famous virologist named Saul Kitt. And when I suggested using viruses and so forth, NASA bought his, stole his his research assistants away from him and paid them more money than he could pay them on the grants. And he made a terrible complaint because 
One of the letters that I wrote back to, I had to write reports back to Baylor from NASA, and I had mentioned that the pressure to spend the federal money by the end of the fiscal year was very, very hard because NASA didn't want to turn back any money. But they, they made quite a big investment. So you were involved in the development of the Lunar Receiving Lab. Yeah, and, right. That was the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. And the idea at the time was we were going to the moon. And I think obviously now we know an awful lot more about life and, and, and what it takes. But Correct. can you describe what it was like back then? Because they thought that there, I mean, the literature I've read well, is... Well, the interesting thing to me was... I mean, we set up animals, we notobiotic animals, we set up tubes with and plates of microbiologists, and we had plant specimens and so forth. There were no rapid methods of determining whether there were any life forms coming back from the moon. Mm -hmm. And I figured, this is where I need to concentrate my research efforts, because this is a big hole of rapid detective methods. People were using plates and tubes, but there, there weren't any really automated equipment and so forth. So that's why I switched my type of research from physiology into that. So, so if I understand it right, they actually had um, Neil and Buzz do tests while they were in flight to see if there was anything living Yes. in the lunar regolith so they could see what the danger was when they returned? That's right. The, the mm -hmm. National Science uh, Group imposed and insisted on this be done. And we would put the astronauts for two weeks into quarantine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what experiments did you teach them to do? I, I taught them, interesting enough, about... <laughs> about proper way to collect a specimen, a sterile specimen, how to handle it once it came back, because we had a series of hoods in the lab that you could pass things from one hood to the other. We tried to keep some of it anaerobic and look to see whether, because the moon has no atmosphere. So we looked for effects using anaerobic conditions and aerobic conditions. Mm -hmm. So, and usual microbiology procedures. So, so when the astronauts came back and they were in quarantine for, for two weeks, did right. you help design that, that quarantine? I helped decide where to swab the astronauts, where to swab the suits, the kind of protection when, when the module would land, uh, how they took them out of the module directly right into suits and so forth if they were contaminated with anything. And they had to wear suits and masks and everything to get into the rafts that picked them up and then into uh, the area where they were taken to the, the quarantine area. So th I've heard this is why we have splashdowns. That's why the Apollo missions came back with splashdowns, because they were worried that if there was life on the moon, right. if it hit the ground, it would crack open vials. That's why they splashed down and they sprayed, they sprayed everything that they could. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. So, yeah. so did you interact with the astronauts directly when they came back from the moon? I didn't talk to them directly because mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was still in another office at NASA, but I, I could see from my, they didn't want, and they wanted as few people as possible interfering with them, just the few that had picked them up so we could see from a distance them walking into, uh, into the isolation area. And they looked pretty healthy. So this, do you think this was the first time that people ever thought about astrobiology? I mean, astrobiology is such a huge field now. I, th I think so, although there was a planetary society and, and the interesting thing was, w when I started to work with rapid methods and so forth, I came across articles on Mars landers and things that injected in and picked up Mars soil and, and uh, the use of, of various types of things that people had really thought about and developed for, for that type of uh, identif identification 
to send an, uh, an instrument up and pick up samples and see. So this, this was already in there. I, NASA offered me a job, but it's about 35 or 40 miles from Houston, and that's where my husband and my children were. So I said I would be glad to consult, which I have still do, and, and consult for them, but I, I went back to Baylor. I didn't stay at NASA. But I did projects because when you have astronauts that are in space and they're weightless, um, you lose bone. It's like a person in bed in the hospital will lose bone. So we did work on, uh, on the jaws and the change in microbiology in the mouth of uh, astronauts and so forth and spacelessness. Wow. So you've had quite a distinguished career since you worked on Apollo. What, what would you consider is, I know it's different between what people say, well, you know, Dr. Goldschmidt's biggest contribution is this, but what do you think your biggest contribution is? If you really want to know what I think has been most important for me, it's been two things. One has been teaching and working with students in the laboratory and, and working with them. And the second thing has been mentoring, particularly mentoring women, because I faced, I faced a lot of things. Now, I'll give you an example. Do you want an example? Sure. When I came back to Baylor, we had a new department chair. And he told me if I wanted to stay in the department, that I would have to put a grant in for my own funds. So Bob Williams said he would co-PI the grant with me because I had been working with him. And I said to Bob, what should I put down for a salary? And I put down the same amount of money, $12,000, that I had been making uh, at the NASA project. And I turned this grant into the office of the new um, the, the new chairman of the Department of Microbiology at Baylor. And he said, I like your grant very much. He says, but you are married and you don't need to make $12,000. He says, your husband is, is tenured. And he said, I'm not going to, to let them pay you $12,000. He said, $10,000 or nothing. He pushed this grant back across the desk. And I said to him, what does my worth as a scientist have anything to do if I am married or single? And he just looked at me, he said, you're married. And he pushed this grant back. He said, I will not sign it to go out of here for $10,000. So I walked out of his lab before I could really hit him. I was clenching my fist and I walked out and I was so mad and I was so upset and I knew then that I had no future at Baylor Medical School in the micro department with that man. So I went to work at MD Anderson doing research and running their clinical microbiology laboratory. So how do you think, what do you think the biggest change for women in microbiology has been? <laughs> I think it's been that there has been more of an acceptance for women in microbiology. Now, when, as I told you, when the department heard I had children, they were upset. When Purdue named me one of their first outstanding alumni and took me back and gave me awards, I brought my children with me. My son, who has a PhD in neuroanatomy and brain function and a postdoc in, in, uh, in uh, computers and artificial intelligence. I brought him back with me. I brought my daughter, who is a lawyer, back with me to show them that a woman could still have children and could still function in a laboratory and produce results and, and, and be as much of a scientist, perhaps, as, as no, no, men aren't questioned when they have children. You know, no one says to a man if they get married, it's, you're not really seriously interested in your career because you have a wife and so forth. So that there is, was a hard time in convincing men that women were serious 
about being professional microbiologists and teaching and men mentoring in spite of being married and having children. And that was, that is important for women to know. And the dean of the, of the graduate school at Purdue was talking to me and said, so many women had opted not to have children because they were afraid. And some of them opted not even to be married. And, and he said, you're a difference. I said, well, I said, Maybe my career would have been a little bit further along. I said, but I am a bench laboratory type of person. I said, and I have been president of my Texas microbiology branch, and I have been active on committees for careers at the ASM. And this is, this is my, what I think about and what I do. And so. So if there was somebody watching this who was brand new, going into undergraduate, and wasn't sure about microbiology, what one piece of advice would you give to that person? I would say to them that I don't understand why the whole world isn't full of microbiologists. It is such a fascinating field, and you can have so much fun. I said, it has so many spokes. I said, I, I have worked, in fact, for 30 years I taught at at Kansas State in the summer, I taught to food microbiologists. I've taught to medical technologists. I even taught, as I told you, beginning chemistry, and I teach virology and, and pathogenic microbiology. I said they are all interrelated, and they are so enjoyable, and they are just so much fun that I just don't understand how people can turn away from from the challenges that you would face in working with microbiologists, whether it's working with the genetics, whether it's working with rapid methods or what. I think it's, so, it's such an exciting life. And I am thrilled that I have been that, that I have been able, and I never told my bosses that I felt my paycheck was a bonus because I was having such a delightful time doing things in the lab teaching and mentoring and so forth. Well, Mimi, I, I, as you know, you and I have worked together on a committee right. for, yeah. for a decade, and I have right. to say I find you remarkable and inspirational. You are, yeah. you are a hoot to work with, and you just make, make everything exciting, and you just you bring that passion to microbiology, and it's infectious what you do. And the most important thing for me is that you are a stalwart when it comes to supporting women in microbiology right. and what you've done for us in this society. And I know right. that when, when there's frustrations and we can't make things happen, all I have to do is talk to you and, and you make <laughs> things happen. You're, you're a dynamic. I, I have been honored to be twice at the CPC committee in the governments and I'm still on the council and I have been honored to serve on various committees and I have received a couple wonderful uh, honors from the ASM, but service is another important, I think. I think teaching, mentoring, and service are three important things that, that are necessary and are very, very enjoyable for women. So maybe that's another conversation we can right. have. So I really appreciate your time. And I hope everybody was able to see the, the phenomenal person that Mimi is and the inspiration that she is to all and of I've us. I've had. You're terrific. Thank right. you.